Namaste. So it's that beautiful moment just before dawn. The sky is pink, birds are singing. And I want to talk to you just as myself, not as a representative of any lineage or religion or anything, but just as a human being. Now, what are we doing here? We are all an expression of the life force. Now, the life force is really inexplicable. It's inconceivable by our tiny brains. So we use different metaphors to describe it and try to grasp it in some ways. So the Buddhists have their metaphors and the, the Zen people have theirs. The Hindus have different, different metaphors in the north and in the south and in different schools and so on. And then there's the Western religions, both the exoteric and the esoteric, and they each have their own metaphors, their own language. But what are we all trying to do? We're trying to describe the same thing, aren't we? And that is the life force, the life principle. Now, on this channel, we're using the metaphor of the goddess, the mother, because that, we have found, is the metaphor that has the most scope, the greatest range of explanation, and supports the greatest range of practices. But that doesn't mean that we objectify it and take it literally and say, you know, there, there really is a lady up there in the sky. <laughs> you know, it's, that would be the same mistake that the Christians make when they make pictures of God sitting on a cloud, you know, creating the world or whatever. So it would be a mistake to objectify any of the metaphors used to describe the life principle. Because why do we make religions? Isn't it because we're afraid? Isn't it out of fear? We don't understand the life principle. We don't understand why it gives us life and then makes us suffer. We don't understand why it gives us some intelligence, but then defeats our intelligence. We don't understand why we're born if we only have to die. We're afraid of that loss of control over our lives, isn't it? So we make up some stories, we make a metaphor to explain these things to ourselves and to others. And then some people try to objectify that metaphor and say, this is the way it really is, and this is the only way, and you know, and so on like that. But come on, you know, it's just a metaphor, okay? Try to understand. The actual thing the life principle itself is completely inexplicable and inconceivable. So why do we tell all these different stories? Because our minds are calibrated for stories. Our minds can digest stories better than abstract principles. And also, the stories contain nuggets of wisdom, which you know, when we hear those stories, 
we have to pry them out. We have to distill them from mere words and try to grasp the deep import. Now, why am I talking like this? Huh? Because I am always looking for a partner or a disciple or a helper, huh? an apprentice, someone to learn this business uh, of teaching or trying to teach the conditioned souls. And I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody that's qualified in terms of knowledge, in terms of being, or in terms of integrity and character. I've been looking my whole life, actually, for someone who I can accept as a peer, or at least potentially as a peer. And I keep coming up short. The people that do come forward, they all seem to have this kind of cheating tendency that they ultimately, they want to take over. They want to be the guru. Huh? But I don't even want to be the guru. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> because it's, it's another metaphor. And as soon as you objectify the metaphor, you, you cut off the real meaning. See, this is the problem. The actuality of life and the life principle cannot fit in any metaphor. The actuality of my existence, for example, cannot fit within the metaphor of guru or master or teacher or whatever you want to call it. The reality of the life principle, the god or the goddess, cannot fit within any of the metaphors that we invent to describe it. So if we become identified with the metaphor and objectify it, <clears throat> then we limit our understanding, we limit our realization, we limit our consciousness. It becomes another upadi that stops us from seeing the reality, the whole. You know, like people want to call me guru, but they don't want to be a disciple. They don't want to come here and surrender. They don't want to do any service. Or if they do any service, it's with the objective of becoming another guru themselves. You know, I've seen it a million times. Well, maybe a thousand. <laughs> but enough to know what is the actual thing. That people come always with some uh, hidden agenda. They don't come innocently. They don't come freshly like a child with a clean heart. They come with all kinds of ideas of their own, all kinds of baggage from the past, and then they want to superimpose that. But see, I don't fit any of those any of those images. I'm bigger than that. Like people call me Swami or Swamiji, right? If I won't let them call, call me Guru, then they want to call me Swami. <laughs> but you see, just like with the, the term Guru, the term Swami is loaded. It carries all kinds of associations and limitations. If you're a Swami, you, can't, you have to do this and you can't do that. Bullshit. Just because somebody calls me by a certain name doesn't limit me. It doesn't limit my consciousness. It doesn't limit my activities. 
I'm free. I can do anything. And you're free too. But why do you need an agenda? What is going on here is called love. Love means you have no agenda. Love means you encounter the life principle, the life force directly and worship it, love it. That's actual self-realization, not some dogmatic clinging to some words or some metaphor or some scripture. Yes, metaphors can be helpful, but not if we become attached to them, not if we use them to limit our perception and our actions, because we're limiting our love. You see, this was the whole problem when I had disciples before. They wanted to see me as guru, as a Swami or Babaji or whatever. And because of that, they wanted to limit my activities. They wanted to say, you have to do this and you can't do that. Well, that might be okay for disciples. But the whole idea of a master is somebody who's free. So if I'm really your spiritual master, if I'm really your guru, I could do whatever I want. And it doesn't change the fact that you're the disciple and I'm the teacher. But they didn't see it that way. They saw that being a guru or being a spiritual master is a rigidly defined role with boundaries. And you can't go outside those boundaries or then you're not their, their guru anymore. Well, that's fine. I don't need people like that around me. I need people around me who understand these things and who aren't willing to put themselves or others in a position of limitation, in a position of objectification, or in a relationship of attachment. See, that goes against everything we're trying to do. This is why religions become their own opposites. This is why all religious organizations are corrupt. Because the personal relationships between the realized beings and the unrealized beings become formalized, externalized, objectified, identified with. You know, these are psychological terms and you have to understand what they mean so that when they happen, when these phenomena actually occur in your life, you can recognize and avoid them. And it's the, the most difficult, the most thankless task to point out to someone what they are not willing to see about themselves, about others, about life. See, why does the goddess ride a lion? Lions are wild. They can't really be tamed. If they can be tamed to some degree, it's only through love. So that's one thing. The fact that the lion serves her and carries her means that there's a relationship of love between them. But she doesn't try to, you know, limit the lion. She doesn't try to make the lion something other than a lion. She loves the lion for being a lion for being wild and free, see? That's the nature of the life principle. It has to be wild, it has to be free. If you try to limit it, it's the same thing as trying to kill it. So all these demons that, that the Devi is killing are those who try to limit the life force, bring it under their control, huh? make a religion out of it, 
rigid, unflexible beliefs and then subject everybody to their limitations. See, these, this is demoniac. This is evil. This is not love. So the whole world is taken over with this evil demoniac philosophy, even so-called spiritual people. And they don't just love. Their love is highly conditional. Their consciousness is also very conditioned. And anything that's outside the limitations of their consciousness simply doesn't exist for them. And so when I try to point out to them what's going on, they can't hear it. Instead, they rebel against me and reject me. And so my whole life has been this same story over and over again because I was born in this consciousness. And everybody around me tried to limit me and stop me from expressing myself naturally. And in the name of religion or whatever, tried to uh, put boundaries there on my life force. And so I became less than what I really am and should be. And my whole life has been a struggle to take that back to become what I really am. And now I feel like I've done that. And the price that I've had to pay is that I have no friends, no helpers, no family, no companions. That is the price of real self-realization. And if some people come around me and they want to be companions or friends or helpers or disciples or whatever. They have to accept this as a condition of my association, that you cannot limit me. You cannot stop me from being what I am. You cannot stop me especially from loving in the way in which I want to love. Because just like Durga and the lion, I don't make limitations on people's life energy, and I don't accept any limitations on mine. So that is the uh, actual principle of guru-disciple. If you want to call me guru, then you have to accept me as I am, without any limitations. And you have to accept that you have a duty to learn. And this is the problem, because every group of people who identified as students or disciples reached a point where they were unwilling to learn anything. And then they turned it around and blamed it on me for being who I am. You know, I don't regret that I rejected those people. Although it's a shame and it's a tragedy and it shouldn't happen like that. I had to reject them because they were trying to turn me into something that I'm not, to objectify me, to limit me, and to stop me from expressing my life energy and my love in the way that is the truth. So this is for those who, who want to call me guru, huh? or who want to call me Swamiji, or who want to be a student or a disciple. If you're coming here for entertainment, you know, don't bother. But if you really want to be a disciple, this is how it has to be. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.